Well, good evening. It's 6.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for coming. My name is John Dillon. I teach journalism classes in the College of Communications. I'm also the uh, Norman Everly Professor of Practice in Journalism, which is a long name for saying that my job is to help students get an appreciation for an understanding of business journalism, science journalism, and even, God forbid, mathematics. So uh, it's my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce Richard Harris, who is the perfect torchbearer for science journalism, communicating about science. Uh, Richard's been a correspondent for the National Public Radio and Science Writing since 1986. Um, he has a degree in biology, and his first job, full-time job out of college, was at the Tri-Valley Herald which, uh, fortunately for a science writer, is located in Livermore, California, where the nuclear weapons lab is, which gave him ample opportunity to start as a, as a very young journalist covering science in a variety of ways. Uh, he then went on to the uh, San Francisco Examiner and then to National Public Radio. He's won many awards, uh, some of the most recent ones, in 2013, the American Geophysical Union's Presidential Citation for Science and Society. And in 2009, he shared an award, uh, the National Academy of Science Communications Award, and he was a finalist again for that award in 2011. He's also been very active nationally and in Washington with science writers associations. He's a co-founder of the Washington, D.C. Area Science Writers Association, past president of the National Association of Science Writers, and serves on the board of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. So we're very pleased to welcome Richard Harris. Thank you very much. And I'll take your math questions at the end of the <laughs> talk, just to prove I can do math too, because it's uh, something that science writers are often called upon to do. There's sometimes uh, uh, people drift up to my desk sort of sheepishly and say, uh, can you make sure I did this percentage right? Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a skill that uh, people sort of think, oh, I can skip through life and not learn math. And the answer is not so much. Uh, and, uh, but science writers know that, that, that math is important. One of my rules is I try not to do the math entirely myself. I, I do an answer. I, I, do, I do a calculation and think I get an answer. And then I call somebody else up and make them do the math just so I can... So if I get it wrong, I can attribute the error to somebody else, not me. Uh, another rule is never do math in public, which uh, uh, if you're on a sort of live radio, don't try to do the math in your head or whatever, or uh, or uh, you know, or giving a talk or whatever. So maybe I won't. Maybe I'll email your answers later when I take your math questions. But I'm going to um, this evening give you a world, whirlwind around the world tour. Uh, John suggested the title, so I felt compelled to make sure I touch on all seven continents uh, in, my, in my conversation. And, uh, and what I want to do is really talk about uh, what science writing is all about and, uh, and uh, how varied it is. People have, a, I think, a pretty narrow view of, of what we do, and I hope I will disabuse you of that by the time I'm done talking. And my first uh, sort of early days, when I decided to be a science writer, I thought, you know, I love stories about you know, dinosaurs. It's just the world is such a fascinating place. And that was really what got me hooked on science reporting. It's like all of these incredibly fun stories you get to tell. And very early in my career, um, I had an opportunity to do some of that. This is, a, uh, this is a paperback from when I was at the San Francisco Examiner in the early 80s. And it was talking about uh, observation that there seemed to be periodicity to the extinctions of dinosaurs and other extinctions on Earth, and that uh, this created all sorts of ideas about why, why would these things be happening on a regular cycle? And one idea was that there's this weird death star called Nemesis that circulates around and, uh, and, and perturbs the Earth's orbit on a regular basis. But it, it's an unanswered question, uh, and it may just be a statistical mirage, as a matter of fact. But I think people are, people are really interested in these kinds of things, and so that was not only a great dinosaur story was also an interesting math story to do as well. Um, and uh, I got a chance to visit these sort of living dinosaurs uh, on uh, the, uh, these are marine iguanas on the Galapagos Islands. I did not take this picture, but I was at the Galapagos Islands 
And if you're counting continents, you can, you can make this number one, right? This is part of, we'll, we'll, we'll count this as part of South America. Uh, and, you know, my travels have taken me to fabulous places. I happen to be doing some stories about the wildlife there, but also about human conflicts uh, between the scientists and the, and the local people on the Galapagos as well. So, uh, so just, for, you know, there was a, there's a science institute there that was, that was being pressured by the locals. So, okay, it's a science story. I'm going to go to the Galapagos Islands. And I kind of had to hitchhike onto a plane because the travel agents had sort of a have a cabal and you can't get on the Galapagos without being part of an organized tour, which of course I was uninterested in. So I, so I convinced the airlines that they had lost my reservation and I was able to talk my way onto my plane. So, okay, uh, a few years later, I actually saw penguins in the Galapagos, as a matter of fact, but this is a, an Antarctic penguin, this is an emperor penguin, that I visited uh, while I was uh, down on continent number two. Uh, and uh, this was in the, in the year 2000, it was, a, it was actually a perfect time to be in Antarctica because during the entire duration of the trip, uh, it was the time when the election had ended and we did not know who the president was. Was it going to be Gore or Bush? Uh, because it was all about the hanging chads in Florida. And instead of reading about that, every single day I was wandering around in Antarctica saying, you guys sort it out, let me know when you have an answer. Uh, and, uh, and so that sort of gives you a time context for what that was. And I, the main reason I was down there was, well, I was supposed to be uh, traveling across the West Antarctic ice sheet, which you may have been reading about, is, is in danger of collapsing and raising global sea levels by a huge amount. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, was hit by a big storm. Actually, most of Antarctica was. And, uh, and my trip down there was delayed by more than a week. And by the time they were resupplying this trek that was going across the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, they no longer had space for me. Uh, they said, you know, uh, resupplying food is much more important than sending some reporter out on, it, on one of these resupply missions, and I had to admit that was, that was probably true. So, uh, I, so I went to Plan B, which turned out to be a fascinating story as well. Uh, the guy with the uh, uh, darker hat is a guy named John Priscu, who is a, uh, uh, a scientist at Montana State University, and the thing he's staring at is this giant uh, instrument that is actually designed to be put in the ocean to measure sediment that sort of falls down through the ocean. It, gets, it collects in, that, in the funnel on top, and, uh, and then it ends up in the little bottles. And if you can see, there's sort of a, uh, a little rotating series of bottles here. And so every few months or three weeks, the, the, it clicks over to the next one. So, he, so, to, so to collect uh, uh, samples of, of, of whatever's drifting down through the water over a long period of time. And his idea was, let's put it in a lake. And this is Lake Bonnie in the in Arctica, and uh, it's like a huge amount of ice. And we had to melt a hole through the ice big enough to get that uh, that funnel in place. And because it, because you know everything is done sort of as a uh, as few as possible number of people people in Antarctica. I sort of became part of his field crew while I was there, worried that the helicopter coming to pick me up would arrive before he got the funnel in the in the. Uh, uh, the sediment trap in the lake, and I was not about to have that. So I was out there helping him melt ice and program the computer and doing things like that as a, as a field hand, and we, we did succeed barely. Um, this is an unusual part of Antarctica called the Dry Valleys, where, uh, as the name implies, there's actually some bare rock in Antarctica. This was the laboratory, and the, the Quonset hut is sort of with the kitchen and so on, the green parts of the laboratories, uh, the little thing shaped like an outhouse, you can guess what that is. And then if you look up the very small specks up on the hill behind the light blue, those were the tents we slept in. Um, and uh, uh, well, while we were on Lake Bonnie, it was really interesting to me how quickly I adapted. It was not that cold. The, the South Pole was like minus 15 or whatever. This was not nearly as cold, but after a little while, you sort of get used to uh, to, to where you are, and, and, and I adapted very quickly to the, to the temperature. But no, I, I kind of get why people can spend a season in Antarctica. Okay, anyone want to guess where this sign is? It shows the North Pole three hours away, Los Angeles six hours, Moscow five hours, New York four hours, Tokyo ten hours, London three hours. Anyone care to guess? This is Greenland. Uh, and actually, I've taken a couple of trips to Greenland. My first trip, I met a truly remarkable person whom I have, uh, in 1992, I think there were thereabouts, whom I have stayed in touch with through uh, all those years, and that's Richard Alley, who's one of the fabulous scientists here at Penn State. And we met not far from the sign, actually, and we spent uh, quite a bit of time up on the 
Greenland, at the crest of Greenland, because he was involved in a project to drill through the center of the core of Greenland to get an ice sample going back uh, and to, to, take, to understand the climate history of the Earth by looking at basically two miles of ice that they collected. But this picture was taken on a second trip I took, and I was with this, uh, a, a group of people, including Ian Jock, and he actually has a better point of view than this, but, uh, but, but uh, this tells the story better because you can see to Ian's right is this little tri trickle of water, and, and I was on a trip trying to understand what happens to the water that collects on the surface of Greenland when it melts. Up near the top, sort of the crest where it's very high, it's two miles thick, it's always too cold to melt, but down in the band, not so far from the coast, it warms up enough in the summer that you actually create these, that you get melting pools of water and they form lakes and so on, and they disappear. The question is, where do they go? And uh, so we were out there tromping around trying to understand the dynamics of this water and what it means for the, for the overall dynamics of the glacier. And before I tell you the answer to where it goes, I, there, 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 this is a bizarre landscape. This is a close-up photograph of something called a cryokonite, which is a uh, uh, melting feature you see all over Greenland. What is happening is this black stuff is probably soot that has accumulated over the years, and it sits on the surface, but when the sun warms it up, it, of course, gets warm and it starts to melt down, and you get all these goofy uh, scenes and so on. It's a little tricky because these are so common in this part of Greenland uh, that uh, we, you, you, know, you had to put, when we were camping with tents, you had to put the tents over these melting features. Uh, so there's always these, be careful not to just sit up on one knee because you might, you might end up putting your knee into a little pocket of water and a cryocline. But at any rate, at the end of our trip, we did indeed find out where the water was going. Uh, well, the one lake we were looking at, and it, and, and it flows into a, this stream that got deeper and deeper and deeper, and ultimately went straight down into a hole called a Mulan about a mile down, straight down to the bottom of the, of the ice sheet, and then ran underneath the ice sheet and went out to sea. They, they were trying to figure out, where can we find out where it goes? And in uh, Jock and, and uh, Sarah Doss, who was also on this expedition, thought, I know, let's get a whole bunch of rubber duckies and just dump you know, a ton of rubber duckies down this, and then go out on the coast and see where we find the rubber duckies uh, showing up. And, uh, they had some fun thinking about what kind of experiments you could run to actually find out where this water went. But one question was, it's, it gets to the bottom of this ice sheet, so it's lubricating. This becomes a lubricating uh, layer down there. And that makes the ice sheet, the question is, how much does that accelerate the motion of the ice sheet uh, to the, uh, into the ocean and, and, and encourage the, the, not, not only just the meltwater, which ends up in the ocean, but encouraging the ice sheet itself to flow off to the ocean. And if you've been following climate change stories, you know that this is a major concern both for Greenland and especially for Antarctica, where, uh, where a lot of these ice sheets are, are, are fundamentally unstable. And the question is, how quickly will they melt and how quickly will they raise global sea level? We know ultimately how much. If Greenland melts entirely, that's 20 feet of sea level, I think. And it's even worse when you uh, add in uh, the Antarctic ice. Uh, we hope that this will take many centuries. <laughs> Uh, but there's some indications that it, that, that it could happen a lot faster than that. And in fact, there's, if you look back in the historical record, there have been periods where basically uh, you get, uh, you've had sea level rises as a result of this melting of like a meter a century. So that's, that's pretty fast. That's three feet a century uh, and for, for many centuries on end. So that could make a big deal of difference. So, um, and by the way, Greenland, you, uh, should I count this as Europe or... Uh, or North America, I'm not sure. Politically, it's Europe. I think geographically, you could argue it's North America. So just for fun, I drew in a slide of Copenhagen, which is clearly Europe, uh, and one of the many uh, climate talks that I've attended over the years. I won't dwell on these stories, but if you want to hear more about uh, the, the, the UN climate talks, I'm happy to talk to you about those. I've been covering them as well. I was in Kyoto, and I started out actually when they negotiated the original treaty in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, the framework of conventional climate change. So I've watched this painfully slow process moved forward over many years. Uh, and uh, I could have shown a picture of, of sleeping delegates, because that's the other thing that always happens. These meetings go far into the night, and you inevitably have pictures of sleeping delegates in the news, which is a good way to tell the story. But I thought, this is more colorful. It says Copenhagen more clearly. Europe. So OK. Uh, mark, your, mark your score card on, the, on continents here. And uh, anybody recognize what this feature is? Right, while I'm trying to, and what, what about this is unusual? 
And I will, I will give you a hint. The answer is, this is one of the most popular tourist destinations on the planet. And I seem to be the only person standing on the Great Wall of China right now. And how did that come about? Well, here's a hint. Uh, this was in the restaurant of my hotel. Uh, it just so happens that I happened to be in China because I was there to cover the SARS epidemic, which was uh, 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 this incredibly uh, contagious respiratory disease that was occasionally very, uh, occasionally fatal. SARS stands for uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And, um, and I went to, to China to, to cover that story for NPR. And I got to, the good news was I got to China and I, and I found the guy from, from uh, a federal health guy from the US government who was there and studying it. He said, well, I've got good news for you. Beijing really does not seem to be a problem because uh, as far as he could tell, he done some, crunched some numbers and he figured there were probably 200 active cases in the entire city. And the whole city was locked down. People were told, stay home, don't go anywhere. The streets were pretty much deserted and, and as the Great Wall suggested. So it's like, so, so, so I didn't feel so bad in terms of my personal risk. Uh, but, the, but then we, as we were talking more, he said, yeah, the only, the only thing you really need to worry about is, you know, just if you happen to be really unlucky and encounter one of those 200 people. And I was talking to him and I realized, He's been going in and out of the hospital to have all of the people in SARS. So of all the people in, in Beijing to sit, to sit across the table from, he was probably probably pretty low on the uh, He should have been pretty low on my list. Uh, but, but it was a very useful conversation. And he looked reasonably healthy. And indeed, he did not spread the disease to me. So, uh, so that was good. But uh, the people who did venture out uh, wore face masks, which is interesting. Because I think, in particular, uh, a lot of these masks uh, had a lot of gaps around them. But it was good because if they had SARS and they were sneezing or breathing into the mask, I think it was actually pretty effective for, to prevent them from giving it to me. I don't think that uh, I don't think that uh, that, that the, the opposite was true though. So they were uh, so they were thinking they were protecting themselves. They probably weren't, but at least they were reducing the risk of, of spread. So so that was uh, so I was happy about that. Uh, this is another story. I don't know why Asia tends up to tends to bring me pretty grim stories, but this is another story I traveled to Asia for. This is uh, the Fukushima Daiichi reactors uh, after the uh, multiple meltdowns there. And uh, I should say that by now you're sort of getting the flavor that science reporting is not all about dinosaurs, right? <laughs> that uh, and some of these stories turn out to be, these are not the cheerful stories that I sort of thought, oh, I'm going to have a career telling people about how wonderful science is and how wonderful the world is as, as scientists explore the world of the universe and biological life and all the rest. And I still get to do a fair amount of that, but I also find that I get drawn into stories where my technical expertise is, is quite useful as well on understanding much more uh, you know, stories that have a lot of potential human impact and stories that have a lot of technical uh, details that, that are important to get right. So this is a story, I did not take this picture, I was mostly in Tokyo uh, uh, during the uh, emergency where most of the emergency uh, Operation was run out of but, uh, but these kinds of stories are a reminder that you know uh, sometimes technology goes wrong and someone needs to be there to uh, to explain how much we should be worried about it. Uh, and I will say that I was somewhat less alarmed about this from the standpoint of human health than most people because most of the time, at least, the wind was blowing out to sea. There were some excursions inland which were which were hazardous, but but uh, you know. You know, many, many people died from the tsunami, essentially, and a, and a few people died from the shock of the wave hitting the, the power plant, but this has caused very few, the, the radiation itself killed a couple of workers, or at least harmed a couple of workers, but it has not had broader health implications, even though it's a very scary thing and it's going to cost a huge amount of money to clean it up. The, the thing we worry about most actually happens to be uh, the relatively low level of risk compared to everything else that was going on as a result of that. Um, another continent, mark your scorecards. This is a this is a trip I took to West Africa, and uh, we actually were camping out. Uh, this is a view from my from my bed. We were this is a goat skin tent over our heads, and and I was out. Uh, in this case, I was out in uh, uh, near Timbuktu uh, in, in northern. Uh, Mali, uh, uh, sort of where Timbuktu. Everyone just, oh, you know, I, I didn't even know where Timbuktu was until I was until I realized I was heading there. But it ha happens to be uh, uh, in uh, in Mali, but way up in the uh, 
far away from the from the coast of the Atlantic, and it's sort of it's sort of the, the final. It's part of the of the of the area called the Sahel, which is sort of halfway between desert and uh, not complete desert, but but fairly arid area. And then the Sahara starts, and so it's sort of the traditional starting off point for people who want to go across the desert from the Sahara from south to the north. You start in Timbuktu, and then you have these camel trails that take you across uh, the Sahara. And so it's a, and it was before, obviously there's been a lot of violence around there, but more recently, and it was a little dodgy when I was there, but it, but uh, not so bad, but I was, uh, not as bad as it is today, but I was out there uh, doing climate change stories, uh, and you can see the people in the background are actually at a well trying to get uh, water out of, a, out of a well that is, this had been a lake for a while, and I guess every year the lake fades away to essentially nothing, and then people dig in the middle of the lake to get a well to, to, to draw water. So I was in this part of the world looking at how people are adapting to climate change and how they're even thinking about it because they have so many pressures, so many uh, risks to their lives that the climate change seems pretty far down the list. I mean, they recognize if it's a really horrible year or whatever, but uh, uh, but the, the, the bottom line for these stories was can't really, you don't really know what's going to happen in this area, in this region in a changed climate, there's actually some possibilities that this will become a wetter part of the world. Uh, but the point is, what the answer is people need resilience. They need to be have some flexibility. So if weather is worse than they thought, they have some, some sort of resources. And there, and there are some efforts to create, to, 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 to build those kinds of uh, resilience into, the, into these societies. And I talked to people about that while I was up there. Uh, it's, they've got more way to go, obviously. But, uh, and, and another uh, trip to, to in, in that same general region where these are uh, locusts, and I I spent a couple uh, about a week chasing a swarm of locusts. It took a long time to catch them, uh, uh, and uh, because we were but we, I wanted to get a, 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 a nice story about what's going on, and it turns out when we finally did get the swarm, uh, they were they were disappointingly quiet. For me, you know? <laughs> they most of the noise they make is sort of munching noise, which doesn't come off very well. And finally, finally, uh, as we were sort of leaving in disappointment, I thought we, the, this whole sort of shaggy dog sort of trying to chase down the locust swarms. And we finally find them, and they don't make a lot of noise. But we're driving back uh, from uh, through Senegal back toward uh, Dakar to the capital to, to fly home. And it turns out that we drove through a little uh, little hot pocket and put these locusts that sort of pelting the windshield of the car. And we quickly pulled out the microphones and the and the, so the signature sound of locusts turned out to be the splattering of these creatures on the windshield. <laughs> so, you, you know, when you have lemons, make lemonade. <laughs> so, and one more story from West Africa, which is, uh, uh, this is in uh, Niger. But, uh, and what that guy's doing is fascinating. You think technology has to be so sophisticated, but actually, uh, this, the, well, the guy in the red is named Larwanu, and he's a forester who really, who's been working on trying to uh, improve the, or basically to expand the trees throughout the, the country of Niger, which is also in that part of West Africa. And he's with a guy who's measuring the height of a tree through a very simple but ingenious method, which is you basically pace out how far you are uh, from the tree uh, to a certain distance, and then you hold up a stick, and using simple geometry, you can figure out how tall the tree is by knowing that if this is like a, you know, a meter long stick, and you hold it just so, uh, you can, and he's actually, you can't quite tell, but he's holding a string to make sure that he's got the stick the right distance from his eye. But basically, simple geometry, simple mathematics allows them to measure the height of a tree without doing anything more than uh, taking a few paces and, and marking it out. And this is a good news story, really, because they were, Niger had succeeded in increasing the, the, uh, the growth of trees, which are, which are good for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they were teaching people not to cut down whole trees, but to sort of trim them for firewood and so on. And, uh, and, and, and Niger is actually getting greener and maybe even soaking up more uh, greenhouse gases than it's contributing, which is pretty remarkable if you compare it to what we're doing. So, and finally, this is my transition back to North America. Uh, this is pretty far Arctic North America. This was on my way actually to the, to, uh, the same trip that I took that, where you see me on the icebreaker from that leaving picture. And this is a snowy owl chick. You can, if you look at the wing at the bottom, you can see the little hint of that beautiful black and white feather pattern. Uh, just basically, these guys were running around uh, uh, eating lemons like crazy across the tundra, having a grand old time of it, and being chased by biologists who wanted to weigh them and so on. 
and uh, I did that. So anyway, let me turn to, to uh, North America closer to home and talk a little bit more about the, sort of the, some of the more difficult stories that I've had to cover over the years. And this was the first report in June of 1981 of this strange uh, condition called meniscus pneumonia that started cropping up in Los Angeles. And, uh, and eventually, uh, people came to realize that this was the first symptom of AIDS. Uh, the first sign that there was this that there was a new disease afoot. They didn't even know there was a virus that was causing it or anything. They just started noticing outbreaks of strange diseases like hemocystis. And uh, I spent a lot of my time in San Francisco covering AIDS, probably about a third of the time that I was uh, at the examiner, uh, just because it was a story that was evolving very rapidly at that time. And of course, we have Zika virus uh, and other viruses that are spread by this is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spreads Zika and uh, chikungunya and Dengue, and it's really not that much fun, um, but uh, uh, but it's also fascinating. And then I just want to say a couple of words about uh, how I deal with some controversial issues because we, because there, there are people in the world who don't accept climate change. There are people in the world who get very nervous about uh, genetically modified organisms. And this is, I think, this illustration actually does not help <coughs> the cause of sort of rational conversation about it because it looks like somebody's adulterating this ear of corn right by injecting something. In it. And, uh, but we, these are very emotional uh, issues, and it's interesting as a science journalist to try to find that right balance and say, okay, this is, you know, and, and sort of put down the scientific foundations for people to make their judgments about this. These, are, these stories go far beyond science. They're about people's perceptions about, you know, how much they trust big business like Monsanto, how much they trust health authorities, and so on. And, uh, and I realize that I can't, there's sort of this, some scientists have this idea, if you could only just tell them the truth, everyone would then see the world the way we see the world. And it's simply not true. It's, uh, and, and, I mean, people bring a lot, of, a lot more than just science to their judgments and their views of the world. And uh, so I think about those sorts of stories. Here's another one that uh, I don't uh, try to win any converts about, evolution. Some people, you know, it's obviously the foundation of, of biology. Uh, but some people, for religious purposes, say, I don't, I, I don't accept evolution, certainly as it applies to human beings. And uh, that's like, but the interesting thing is, people can compartmentalize. Many people who don't accept uh, that humans are a product of evolution can still say, but I trust medicine, I trust many other products of science. So a lot of scientists throw up their hands and say, oh, they don't even believe in evolution, forget about it. And it's not true, in fact. Uh, people can come up, people can, people can, you know, hold these, you know, just the way physicists can, you know, think of light as both a particle and a wave, people can hold these different ideas uh, and live perfectly uh, sensible lives without having to accept every word of, of science. But it is a, it is a frustration when people uh, disbelieve things that, are, that have health consequences and things like that. But take just a couple minutes to talk about uh, uh, one of the major stories I covered, which was the BP oil spill. This is the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. In the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, killed 11 men who were on that rig, and uh, and the story that that I was involved in was trying to estimate how much oil was coming out of that. And the official government estimates was about 5,000 barrels a day, based on how much oil they saw on the surface. But I was in constant com contact with a scientist named Ian McDonald at, at uh, Florida State University, Florida State University, who said, "No, if this oil is coming up through 5,000 feet of water." Measuring what is actually just floating around on the surface is a pretty poor way of get, gauging the um, uh, the actual volume of, of oil that's coming out. Uh, and so I was trying to figure out, and he was trying to brainstorm how to how to how to figure out a better way to do that. And we were watching a uh, press conference that the Coast Guard put together. And the Coast Guard showed in the background, unless you can see it on this next picture, that the oil actually this isn't exactly the right picture, but coming up out of the pipe that was lying on the, on the seafloor, and, uh, and Ian McDonald called me and said, did you see that picture? Did you see that picture? And I said, yeah. I said, well, you know, there are people who know how to interpret the, the flow coming from that. Uh, I don't know who they are, but figure out who they are and get them to, to do some, some calculations. So I called three people using three different methods, and this guy's name is Steve Worley, who's at Purdue University, and he uh, is an expert in something called particle image velocimetry which is a technique where you just basically follow a particle that's flowing out of the pipe. Uh, there's, and you 
can, and if you if you watch the velocity of the particles, you can figure out how, you know, what rate is coming out. You can see that it sort of varies across the spec, across the, the length of a pipe. This is just this isn't a pipe example, but this is an example of these of, of basically the basic technique. And Steve Worley, using these techniques, um, uh, came up and said, and I, I gave him the video, and I said, you have time to analyze this. He said, yeah, I'll take a look. And I asked two other scientists using different methods, and they came up with s very similar answers. And his answer was, it was 72,000 barrels a day, not 5,000 barrels a day. And uh, vastly more than uh, the government had been estimating. And uh, I put that up in the air. The government said, oh, that can't be true. We're going to create our own task force to look at this. And among, actually, among the people that went on the task force was Steve Worley. And lo and behold, they came up with very, very similar numbers, but after being quite skeptical for a while. But I, uh, I, I, I got people to think much more seriously about how much oil was coming out. It really affected the way that BP was handling the spill anyway, because they were operating under the assumption that it was a fairly small flow. Not that small, it was still big. But their, all the contraptions they were trying to do to capture the oil in retrospect it became abundantly clear that they were, even if they, any of these sort of schemes succeeded, uh, they would only capture a fairly small fraction of the oil. It took several months more. Um, they did capture some of it, but it took several months more for them to actually seal off the well in the end. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to actually go and get as close as anyone actually ever got to that wellhead. This is a submersible called the Alvin, which is a, a tiny submarine that holds three people. Uh, and uh, I was invited along at, around Thanksgiving time that year to go down and take a dive within a couple miles of the, of the wellhead to survey the, the ocean floor uh, to, to see what actually had happened. There had been remotely operated vehicles down there, but this is the first time that, uh, that, we, that uh, human beings actually went down and we were able to peer through portholes and so on. And uh, here are the divers preparing the album to dive down through 5,000 feet of water, a truly spectacular and eerie experience watching the, the light get dark and the little particles raining all around me. And uh, interesting sea creatures. And I got to the bottom uh, with uh, uh, Samantha Joy, who is there taking notes. Uh, those are my feet, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and here's the pilot. Uh, very nice picture of the pilot. Uh, but it's a very cramped, very cramped quarters. But we were down there for a couple of hours uh, scanning the bottom of the of the seafloor and, and trying to understand the impact of it. And it's not a barren seafloor, even at 5,000 feet. This is a slightly different location. I did not take this picture. Uh, but uh, uh, thank goodness, uh, it was taken by a remote camera. But these are deep sea corals that are, uh, that are down there. And this is the kind of environment we were looking at. And you can see this sort of gray fuzz everywhere. It's part of the sediment. They, a lot of the oil was digested rather rapidly by organisms in the, in the water, and it just rained down and created this sort of like this, this, this coating, this gray coating throughout across the bottom of the seafloor. And it's still, uh, as far as I know, still an ongoing question about uh, what impact that's had, had ecologically in the Gulf. So switching continents again. Uh, this is, and we're getting close, right? I think if you're, if you're counting, you probably have, you have one shoe off already. Uh, this is a, a, a woman named Sophie Dove, who's a scientist at the University of Queensland. And here she is on Heron Island. And this is a global, this is a, a, an experiment having to do with global warming and carbon dioxide in the ocean. Because not only does carbon dioxide, not only does global warming warm up the planet, and also a lot of the carbon dioxide we put in the air ends up getting soaked up into the ocean. A huge amount of it does. And it changes the acidity of the ocean. It makes it more acidic. And so she had these big tubs and was experimenting to see what would happen as she kept increasing the temperature and the acidity of the, of the, of the water. And she had these tiny uh, coral reefs there. And as you can see, this is a piece of coral that used to be glor gloriously colorful. And, uh, uh, and it is at, at this degree of acidity, which we're not far from, uh, it, it really affects the, the, the coral very, very strongly. And the question is, if, if this happens more slowly than she made it happen, can the coral adapt? Is there, you know, how, you know, but, uh, so this may be a worst case scenario. Let's hope this is a worst case scenario. But, uh, but that's the, the sorts of questions people are trying to answer. And I was actually out there because I was chasing along with, behind this guy whose name is Ken Caldera, who is at the, uh, uh, he says, the Carnegie Institution of Science, but I think some other people would say the Carnegie Institution of Science. Uh, it's a it's sort of point of contention about whether you should pronounce it the same way that Carnegie did, or Carnegie did, or the way that people sort of talk about Carnegie Hall. But at any rate, this is 
a nearby reef uh, called the uh, Lone Tree Island Reef. Uh, and he is uh, preparing this experiment to put a bunch of water across the, or dye across the, uh, the reef in order to, uh, uh, to see, to watch the flow. He's actually watching the flow, and then he's going to put a little antacid up across the reef, and let the antacid wash across the reef to see if he can slow down reef erosion. He obviously couldn't dump acid on the reef to see if he could make it worse, but he could do the end of this experiment. Uh, and he actually did find some results. I'm running really late on time, and I still have a bunch of slides. I'm going to start skipping them. Uh, uh, just to uh, move along a little bit, but the, the next story I'm talking about, actually I will show the picture of, of, of uh, Tom Murphy, because my current project is a, a book, I'm only from NPR, I'm writing a book about uh, biomedical research and, and, how, and how screwed up it is basically, and it has real world impacts on people like uh, Tom Murphy who has ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he was on a drug trial, and the drug just didn't work for him. In fact, none of the drugs have worked uh, in ALS, and one re or, or one has barely worked. And uh, a research group went back and said, I wonder why these drugs aren't working. And they went back and they redid the original animal studies, and they discovered the original animal studies that suggested these were promising drugs were all terrible. They were all done very, very poorly. And those blue bars show the original results of, of, of what these animal studies showed, which all showed some improvement in, in survival. And the dark bars, when these guys did the experiment again, showed um, that uh, that actually, in reality, if you do the experiments work correctly, you don't get any, you don't get anything like that. And this is a this is a very significant problem throughout biomedicine. All sorts of reasons for it, and my book explores those reasons. But I've been spending my time uh, looking at those things. This is a uh, this is another example from the book. I will skip. This is a this is actually one example I will tell of you about, which is a a cell line that was isolated in. Uh, 1976, from a woman who had breast cancer, a 31-year-old woman who died uh, uh, with a very aggressive form of breast cancer, and they isolated some cells from her, figuring, okay, we have these breast cancer cells, we can use them to really study and understand breast cancer. And they had these, uh, they published this paper saying, here, are, here are these beautiful cells, uh, please use them. And they've been used, they've been used in in thousands of studies, or more than a thousand studies that have been published. And uh, except in the year 2000, somebody did a genetic analysis uh, of them when the, when the tools of genetics were strong enough and said, guess what, guys? These are not breast cancer cells. These are melanoma cells. Somewhere along the line, there's a mix-up. And there are literally there are like four, more than 400 cases of mixed-up cells that are used abundantly in, in science. And people don't bother to check their cells. But the irony is that even though it was published in 2000 that these are actually melanoma cells, and this is actually in a major collection of federal, sort of a, the top 60 cancer cells called the NCR60. Uh, people still publish this as, as breast cancer. They don't read the literature, they don't realize that these are, these are melanoma cells that's been very well established. So that's just, I mean, I, I, my book is full of examples like that, but that's a particularly crazy one. Here's another just a paper that shows uh, these cell lines. And it, the, you know, a test to figure them out uh, costs uh, 130 bucks or something like that. But scientists say, oh, I, my lab budget's too tight. I'm not going to uh, bother to spend that money. And so there's a huge amount of stuff that, are, that a lot of research that's been done on contaminated cells and gets done on contaminated cells all the time. Why should we care? Well, this, is, this shows the trend in new drug development. Uh, and it shows that over the years, it's, it's fewer and fewer drugs have been developed, and that each one costs more and more and more. And if you extrapolate this curve by the year 2040, we'll have no new drugs. Now, obviously, the, the curve actually, since this paper is published, the curve has flattened out and maybe even gone up a little bit. So it's not, we're not actually going to have zero drugs by then. But the point is that, that research and development of new drugs has gotten slower and slower. The guy who published this uh, called this Eroom's Law, which is the opposite of Moore's Law, which and Moore's Law describes the increasingly rapid uh, uh, expanse and, and efficiency of, of, of computer chips. So he's, he, played, he turned the word around and said, we're, we're seeing the exact opposite in drug development. And so, uh, that's, uh, so that's just a, a, a brief taste of my, of my book and the, and the sorts of things I've been thinking about in the past year. And I will end with uh, where, we, where we kind of began on, on the poster. And this is sort of, uh, this is a, a view of the Arctic Ocean when I was up there on the icebreaker. And, uh, and doing one of those sort of uplifting stories as opposed to one of the stories that sort of makes you uh, pout on your hair. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. So Richard would be happy to
can take questions for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. So questions? Yes. Hey, um, I was just kind of wondering, whenever you're following scientists, like for example, when you were, like, you talked a lot the rubber duck story, and like the Mulan. The Mulan, yeah. yeah. Um, do you, like, whenever they're brainstorming solutions, because it's kind of an unknown area, do you participate in the brainstorming, or do you think it's more journalistic to kind of just, like, observe? Um, I guess it's hard to resist, right? So I'm sure I, I, you know, I don't put my own participation on the air, but I'm sure that I offered some suggestions <laughs> along the way. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, they're they're just having. I mean, it's serious, but it's also sort of fun to, for them to sort of bring sort of having this type of thing. You know, if they'd taken a bunch of that for us and died, I guess that would be another way they could have done it. But they were just, you know, they're just having fun, and uh, and uh, and it's part of my reporting to sort of budget people and, and uh, anyway and get them to uh, you know to challenge their assumptions a little bit and, and so that's all part and parcel of that and some conversation. Yes. What kind of stories do you find most intimidating when you start out? Most Physics, math, but... Yeah. Well math stories are it's really hard to do math stories. I've done very few in my career. Uh, math is just uh, on the radio. I mean one of my rules is try Try never to put more than two numbers in the story. <laughs> so eh, maybe I maybe I maybe I break that rule occasionally, but that's a good rule to do. So doing a math story with two than two numbers, I think I've done it. I remember doing a profile of a of a fascinating mathematician, but those are really hard to do. Uh, the other stories that are that can be very difficult, depending upon where you go, uh, sort of what the topic is, is physics. Um, uh, and uh, I remember actually a piece of audio someplace on my computer. I could probably find it. Relatively, except this is not hooked up to audio up here. But I remember there was a, an interesting paper that had come out in a journal with surface plasmons. And, and I thought, surface plasma? Hmm. And it was, how it is an important discovery, et cetera, et cetera. And I tried to read the paper, and I absolutely could not read the paper. So I called up the scientist, uh, and I said, you know, can you explain to me what the surface plasma is? I said, I said, in really simple terms, can you explain to me what a surface plasma is? And he said, in really simple terms, in really simple terms, a surface plasma is a, and then he launched in this string of completely incredible <laughs> words. I mean, I understood a couple of the words, but it was like completely useless, you know, in nanoparticle, meta semi-metallic nitrogen or hot room. It was like, okay, you know, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was completely ridiculous. Uh, and uh, I have, I, it was so bad, I actually kept the, the, the clip of him saying it. The bad news was he was very reluctant to talk to me. He said, you know, I don't want, I don't want you to make me sound stupid or, you know, or, or he, his English wasn't that great either, he had a strong accent. He said, no, I don't want to be, you know, uh, and so I had to promise not to, to, uh, to, to do anything like forward with this tape, but it was hysterical and I could not use it because I had promised him that it might have embarrassed him to be, because I would have had to come out of it and say, yeah, you know, you know, we can't explain it either. And you know, it's but uh, so so those those stories can be kind of crazy. But I mean, other physics is not so hard. It really depends. It depends how deep you want to go. Because I mean, NPR, we're not you know, writing a textbook, right? So it's so can you get the big picture across without uh, and uh, and so like talking about the Higgs boson or something like that it turns out not to be that difficult, even though it's incredibly complicated. You know, fourteen billion dollar experiment and. Uh, you know, thousands of scientists working on these things, you'd think that that would be really tricky. It's not that bad, actually. Uh, but, yes. Yes. When we send embargoed research press releases to NPR, uh, do you, I'm, so I could send it to individual reporters, to programs like Science Friday, or to a central NPR place, is there one way that's better than another? When I send to individual reporters, they don't complain. Yeah, no, individual but, reporters are the way to go. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what central place you might send them to. Um, but, but yeah, but we don't, but you should also send them to uh, Science Friday because that's a completely separate operation from, from what we do on, on the NPR Science Desk. So it's, they, they, they're completely independent. So. Yeah, I sent to Science Desk and then also to individual. Yeah, you shouldn't readers. send it to Science Desk. That's not supposed to be a public email address, and uh, most people it's not useful. But if, but but if you know what the beats of reporters are, you should tailor make your you know, tailor your list of your sending 
agricultural stories, you should send them to Dan Charles. If you're doing biomedical stories, you need to prop sign, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you, you know the names, you know who does what. But uh, you shouldn't fill people's inboxes. There's no reason to send a biomedical story to, to, uh, you know, to somebody who's covered food and agriculture. So, yeah. Got it. Yes? Would you talk a little bit about your transition from being a, a writing reporter to doing podcasts, basically, or radio? Yeah, radio. Sure. Um, that was uh, that was a, not an easy transition for me. Uh, a, a, there were a lot of things to learn. Uh, the structure of a radio story is different. It's much more like a magazine story, and its structure it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Even a news story has that kind of a structure. The nice thing is you can have to like a, a surprise ending, a kicker, a twist, or something like that. And the idea is that people are listening at the beginning; they'll be listening at the end, uh, unless they find it so disgusting they turn off the radio. But that doesn't usually happen. So, uh, so the structure of the pieces are different. The way that means the way I interview people is different because I want everyone I'm talking to to tell a story or at least part of a story. So that's also that's also different. The writing is writing for voice, which is a very different experience too because people tend to speak in shorter sentences. It's very different sentence structure. A lot of repetition. You, if you read one of my scripts, you might think, ah, oh, this isn't really very good writing, but it sounds right on the ear. And if I if I were trying to read a magazine story out loud on the radio, you'd go, yeah, that's a little hard. Uh, so, so understanding what my internal voice is and writing to that voice is not an easy discovery for me to make. I, I think most people actually have, have, who've gone from print to broadcasting have probably had it jar. My perception is most of them had an easier time than I did in making that transition. But, but those are a few of the things. The plus side is, of course, voices are full of emotion. So, uh, no matter how articulate a quote is on paper, you, you learn so much more, you get so much more feeling from hearing somebody speak, whether it's my voice explaining in you know, awe and wonder or in perplexity, or a source who is you know, expressing whatever emotions they're expressing. So, so it adds this wonderful dimension, and to the extent that you sort of can create mental images in people's minds, I think it actually, audio alone engages people's brains more than video does, video plus audio. Because the video is, is you know, dragging by the throat and telling you what to, what to think and what to imagine. Whereas you don't, if you don't have that, and I'm put, you know, putting a lot of crackling ice here, you may not see this perfect sunset, but you'll you'll see your own sunset in your own mind, and it's a, and it's a very powerful tool. So, uh, so that I, I find that is is one of my favorite parts about writing for sound is that you get you get to tap much more directly into that into those emotions. Yes? So you said this on your seven months of journey. Is there any place you would like to go back to and maybe spend more time here and go more in depth? Yeah. Well, so many wonderful places. Um, it's hard. To, uh, I mean, I don't want to. I don't, yeah. I, it, there's, that's a little tricky because I don't want to make it seem like the, all of the generous money that people are providing to the local radio stations are used to give me pleasure and enjoyment on my world uh, tours. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I do make sure I'm doing. You know, serious and, and, and appropriate reporting on it out there. But I would, I, I, ice fascinates me. I'd love to go back to Antarctica. I'd like to get to the West Antarctic ice sheet that I that was the, the, the trip that I missed there. I mean, I, I was in the Amazon rainforest, which was fabulous. It would be interesting to go back there. I actually have not been in many places in, in Southeast Asia, and that would be interesting to me also. But again, that's sort of, I have to separate my personal wish list from, you know, where are the right stories to go, and what are the, what are the right stories to tell for our audience. So, so that, you know, if I'm honest, that's, what's, that's what drives my decision. That was my question. How do you know what's right? Like, how For example, the Antarctica trip, I had talked to John Christie, who was the scientist who was working on the sediment trap. But I, I just could tell by talking on the phone, he had interesting ideas, he was going to be articulate, he was doing an interesting project, and I knew that that was going to be a good, uh, that was going to be an interesting time with him. Sometimes it's much more difficult when I was, uh, particularly if you're traveling in the developed world, uh, it's really hard to do things in advance, uh, and, and you just sort of have to count on luck, essentially, to, to stumble into things. 
And normally, for example, when I was doing the tuberculosis stories uh, in, in West Africa, I didn't really know where I was going to go, but I knew there was a fabulous guy at the CDC who's based in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and, and I just knew that I, that was going to be my first stop, and I couldn't plan the trip beyond that, and I get there, uh, and I'm talking to him, and, you know, I corresponded with him a little bit, and uh, it turns out, he said, I want you to meet somebody named Pili Pili, and I said, okay, uh, and, and this, this rather remarkable guy who's a Maasai tribesman uh, had driven in from really halfway across the country to pick me up and take me to, the, to where he was doing TB treatment for, uh, for other people in Maasai. These are, these are wandering tribesmen who, who, don't, who move from place to place and don't have a permanent home. And the way you have to treat tuberculosis is make sure people get their drugs every single day for six months. So you have to convince people to sit still for six months so you can monitor and make sure that you don't just can't hand them a pill bottle. It's it, the way that TB has to be treated is it has to be monitored every day to make sure people really take their pills, otherwise they won't. And, and he had managed to turn a, a clinic that the Dutch government has, had established, a health clinic sort of on the, foot of, on, the, on the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. And the Dutch at some point said, hey, we're, gonna, we're reorganizing our foreign aid effort and we're not going to give money to corrupt governments. And that includes Kenya, Daniel Arapmoy was president of Kenya. And, and they just thought this is pouring into a black hole. So the Dutch basically pulled out, but they still had their health facility there. And this Maasai tribesman with some money shoveled to them by the by our, our own federal Centers for Disease Control Prevention uh, was able to was able to keep this clinic going as the TB treatment clinic. And 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 he drove me down there, and we spent a couple of days just uh, seeing how this worked. And and. And it was because he was Maasai, he was treating Maasai, they trusted him when he said, look, you've got to sit, sit still for six months and get treated, otherwise your, your sickness will come right back again. And it was, a, it was really working, it was amazing. But it was not something, that's just one example, but many, many times traveling in the developing world, you can't plan on that, you know. And then I, I lucked into the fact that there was a woman, while I was there, a woman who was reunited with her child had been sick, and she, had, you know, her child had been taken there by family members, and she shows up to find her picture. Her child looks like the perfect moment. And I got back and I did the story, one of the producers said, so how do you time that out so perfectly? I said, I think it was just luck. Uh, uh, but the, the thing about traveling in the developed world often is that there's so much surprising, there's so much that's going on that, uh, that's just happening spontaneously that if you keep your eyes open, you can find interesting examples like that. So, so plan when you complain and count on luck when you can't plan. <laughs> so, That's a good question. I must confess, I'm a little bit behind on that. But the coral, the coral in the in the deep part of the of the Gulf of Mexico, you, I, you saw the picture of that coral that's like way, way down. This is like almost a mile below the surface, and that's not really a coral reef. Those are individual coral trees, and they grow to about the height of your brother. I presume that's your brother. It takes like a hundred years to get that tall. These corals grow incredibly slowly, and they're. It's going to take them a while to understand whether this is much of their growth because it grows so slowly, but that's one of the things they're studying. Many of the other coral reefs in the, in the Caribbean are around islands and so on. And fortunately, they were at a great distance from the spill, so the oil did not get down to the reefs in the, in the Caribbean, the, the, most of the shallow reefs surrounding islands and so on. So that's good at least. But the, uh, but the deep sea corals, very delicate and fascinating uh, organisms. Uh, they still still trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Just a brief comment and a question. So actually, research on the corals is going on here at Penn State um, in the biology department. Um, what recommendations do you have for scientists for making people appreciate science more? Um, yeah. Actually, I talked to I forgot his name, but the the, the coral researcher here, Chuck Fisher. John Fisher, yeah, who's, who's a terrific, terrific person. Uh, my advice to scientists is, um, is show why you're excited about what you're doing. People are passionate about what they're doing, and often when it, when a reporter shows up, it's like, well, I just have to recite my data and try not to screw up. But the but the, the truth is, science is a human endeavor, right? It's a fact. It's a it's it's an exciting intellectual thing. You're interested. You're excited. 
uh, about something for a reason. You've got a puzzle. You're working on something. One hopes you're working on something because it fascinates you. And and convey that when you're talking to reporters, and they can convey that to the public. I mean, it's you know that's that's the wonder of science. We are exploring our our world and our universe. And if you can convey that idea, obviously using simple language and and so on. But the most important thing is 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 to show you're excited and show that you know why people should care, even if it's something obscure that doesn't seem like it's not going to cure cancer in the next 10 years or whatever, but it it's just a fascinating biological or whatever kind of problem it is. That's, um, that's a, I think that uh, more than anything else, I think my most successful stories are successful because the people involved show their passion. Yes. Uh, you talked about the balance between science and people's beliefs. Um, are there any moments where you just thought, you know, forget about their beliefs, the science is what it is, and it's, it's strong, or it's, it's what yeah. you... I, I think that all the time. I feel my job is to convey the science, and not to say, and, and say, look, if, not to say, not to convince people that if they don't, be, don't believe something, that I'm going to convince them Otherwise, I don't. I don't think we're going to make converts by, you know, this is sort of the information deficit hypothesis. It's called that if only people knew, they would change. They would change their way of thinking. And I don't believe that's true at all. But I do believe my job is to is to explain the science as, as, as clearly as I can and say, here's the science. Here's what scientists say. Here's what comes out of the world of science. And recognize people will see that through their own filters. They may choose to disbelieve it if it goes against various of their own personal beliefs or whatever. But that's. That's beyond my control. But I do look at the world through a scientific lens, and I say, here's, here's what's going on, and, uh, and recognize that people will interpret that maybe in a different way. Yeah. It took me a while to realize that I was, like, I, I was sort of caught up with that idea, too, that, you know, that I could convince people and, and, and tell them. Until I really started understanding what was there's some psychological literature about this, and sociological literature about this, and, by the, and eventually I realized that that was a fool's error to try to change people's minds. But just, just to say, look, here's what science says. Look at it through your lens. Yes? Isn't there a role for science writers to change public policy or public opinion? Let's say you have something like um, corn-based ethanol and fuel that most scientists agree is a bad product for mm -hmm. everybody except for corn lungs. Why shouldn't science writers help change some bad things within? Yeah. You know, well, I certainly, I've certainly done stories about the fact that you know about the, the crummy energetics of that. That basically it doesn't make sense. Uh, and uh, and so we we do deliver those facts, and I think we do seek out the people who uh, and we and we, we talk about those issues for sure uh, and explain that you know there's it, at root some of these things are political, not scientific, but it's not. I'm not going to start a lobbying campaign uh, on Capitol Hill to change that up. But I'm going to say, look, you're, you know, the consequence of this is, 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 you know, to tear down more rainforests and so on, to expand the crop areas of, of the planet and so on. And is that really the, you know, and for what? You're not really gaining anything in terms of the of emissions. So, so I, so I try to, I guess you call that speaking truth to power. So I, you know, I, I do, I have certainly done stories like that, and we, and I think. If you look at sort of the coverage by science journalists, I think that would be uh, fairly overwhelmingly the coverage. Maybe I'm wrong, but that would certainly be my impression. That a lot of people recognize that this may have seemed like a good idea for a brief period of time, but as as people started to understand the, the consequences, the real life consequences, they realized, oh, this really only helps the the uh, agribusiness, and it's not really the environmental environmental useful thing to do. Uh, what do you do when you encounter pseudoscience or really poor science? Do you report it on things like that? Uh, uh, only if, if, if I feel, or NPR feels that something needs to be debunked, yes. I think just as a regular course of affairs, we don't. But I mean, if something starts to really take off, and I'm, you know, I remember, this is, a few, this is quite a number of years ago, but, uh, but the New York Times ran a piece that uh, about a new kind of uh, cancer treatment that uh, you know, the reporter quoted Jim Watson, who just you know co-discoverer of, of DNA, as saying 
uh, Jonas Bolkman, who made this discovery. She, he said, Jonas going to cure cancer in two years. And she built her whole story around that quote, which was completely, you know, irresponsible because because uh, uh, Jim Watson will say anything. And he's not he's, he's not quite the Donald Trump of, of science, but he's not he's not a reliable source on anything. And every, everybody who knows him knows that he's a, you know, he's a brilliant person, but he'll shoot off his mouth about anything. And to build a story basically basically around the Jim Watson quote is kind of uh, is perilous, let's put it that way. And, uh, and then the, the Time Magazine put it on the cover of Time, and, and so we immediately did a story saying, this is just ridiculous, you know. It wasn't quite pseudoscience, it was just really bad science reporting, and, uh, which even the Great New York Times does occasionally. And, uh, and so we'll do something like that. Um, you know, people, I still talk, occasionally talk about climate skeptics, but we realize that, you know, all, that all 50 uh, Republicans who were... Uh, elected to the House of Representatives in the latest election for climate denier, you can't pretend that climate denial is not happening, right? That there's not a, a real thing to talk about. And so you have to acknowledge that in, in some sense and where these people get in their information. And, and so those, those stories occasionally, I'll, I'll do that kind of story. But I won't portray it as, these scientists say this, these scientists say that, you decide. So that's, that's, uh, that's not the way to cover this, that kind of story. We have time for one more question, if anybody has one. What is a skiing story? My skiing story. <laughs> um, did you think of the name of the town? Uh, OK, so this was, in a, this was a, 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 a class today. Somebody was asked, asked sort of what, what sort of what my adventures were. One of my uh, more memorable adventures was a few years ago, I got interested in doing a story about a researcher named Tom Painter, who was at uh, he was in at Colorado at the time, and, uh, and he studied the effects of dust on snow, the dust blowing as far away from China, blows across the ocean, and it lands on, um, on the Rockies, and it's dark, so it makes the snow melt faster, and as a result, uh, what happens is, if it melts faster, then you have a shorter season of runoff, and, and it affects, you know, water damage from users of this water. So he was trying to really understand this phenomenon, and he said, and I called him up to talk about it. I said, oh, as a matter of fact, I'm going up into the, the mountains, uh, into the San Juans in a little while. You want to come with me? I said, sure. What does that involve? He said, well, we'll just ski up to some of my research sites. And I said, oh, I haven't really skied in about 30 years. He said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's my story. So uh, it's just a couple of miles. It's, it's just fine. It's, it's, it'll be really easy. So, so, I, so I went up to, up to Colorado, rented some mountaineering skis, put skins on it. I don't know what your skins are, but they basically help. They, they essentially give the skis traction. So you can ski up a hill with these, uh, with what are essentially mountaineering skis or sort of downhill skis. And so we so go a little ways, a little farther, a little farther, a little farther. Before we know it, we're at the very top of the San Juan Mountains. We're looking down over the crest of the other side down to uh, uh, Telluride. It's a tiny little resort town that is on the other side. It's way down below there. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, we're really up high up here. And I turn around to look out in the trail. We have to go back down and realize, Oh, I didn't see that steep coming up. <laughs> so uh, um, and then I realized I really didn't really remember how to ski. So uh, and everybody else was expert skiers on this, on this on this trip. So I said, well, I'll just try leaving the skins on the skis in the first place. And that, of course, didn't work at all because it's like driving with your brakes on, and I immediately, you know, face planted and so on. And gradually, I started getting down the hill just by you know slipping and sliding and falling when I was going too fast and so on. But it was getting late, and the sun was starting to set, and, they were, and the group started, I think, getting a little bit worried that we would still be out there in the dark, and it was starting to ice over, which is no good. But it turns out that uh, by dint of great fortune, one of the people on this ski, on this, on this snow expedition, was uh, the father of extreme skiing. This guy had basically skied down sheer vertical cliffs, and he had skied routes that no one has ever had ever skied down before and maybe never since. He was just this maniac guy. One slight slip and you die, right? Because you're skiing mostly over rocks and barely skipping one slip. But he was a he was a good skier. Uh, and uh, and he uh, and he said, just follow me. He saw how he saw basically what I could and couldn't do. I could do stand crusty turns by the time it warmed up a little bit. And uh, and he said, just follow me and he cut this perfect trail down the hill and I just followed him down and we made it to the car right before sunset. So, so that was that was the uh, that was the the adventure of oh just come on. <laughs> so, you know. Okay. Richard.
much as my party 